Ben Blow Accra Academy. Welcome to tonight's edition of the AOBA webinar series. My name is Yao Kuono and I'll be your regular host tonight. Thanks to Blow B, Chris Fletcher for that wonderful piano rendition of the Accra Academy anthem. I believe for most of you gathered here tonight, uh, each time you hear this, you, you, you feel some goosebumps. It reminds you of the old times and it reminds you of the values that you have gained from the Accra Academy. Again, um, these series have been instituted- Boss, yo, we by... can't hear you. Okay. Um... Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I can hear you. Loud and clear, loud and clear. All right. Thank you very much. So I was saying, uh, welcome to the Alba webinar series. This is the fourth edition. And I believe that hearing that succulent piano rendition of the Accra Academy anthem reminds you of uh, the good old days in Accra Academy. And it brings to memory the beautiful things that we took away from that school. Um, and one of the things that I pride myself with is the fact that uh, we learn not for school, uh, but for life. And that, on that beautiful note, uh, I want to welcome all of you to this amazing series. Um, Blau B, uh, Albert Quarte is, is set to give us an opening remark before we zoom into today's uh, session. But before we do, uh, a few ground rules. Some of you, especially the regular participants, you know these already. Kindly keep all your um, uh, microphones on mute as much as possible. Well, depending on your data capability, uh, you, you are free to either turn on your video or turn off your video. But we recommend that you turn off your video just so that the, speaker, the speaker's video becomes the main uh, focal video. Okay. And also please use the raise hand function in Zoom uh, when it's time for interaction uh, so that you can contribute to the, to the discussion. Remember the chat um, function is also open and you can send in your questions even ahead of uh, the end of the presentation. So if Blaubi uh, Albert Quarte is here, Albert Quarte, if you are here, I would ask uh, you to please give a brief opening remark on behalf of the AOBA executive, and then we can zoom straight into the reason why we are here tonight. Over yeah, to very you. well, Mr. Moderator. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, good evening to you, fellow Blaubi and Smogans who have joined us here in. I welcome you all to this um, uh, series, which happens to be the fourth one. Um, in the COVID period, uh, we are now in new normal life. So this is one of the initiatives to make our work very relevant. And also for Blaubi to con connect, network among themselves for individual and collective improvement, which will benefit year groups, Ahoba and Natural Academy, invariably. It is on this note that I'll commend the brain behind this and organizers of this uh, series, which has been ongoing for the time being. Good to to Yaoko Ono and his team. Permit me to also introduce, permit me to also introduce the main speaker for this series. He is by name, Dr. Dr. Ishmael Dodu. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to read everything. I'm going to depart from the normal introduction because the topic the topic explains it well. So without much ado, I'll just welcome the speaker to take us through whatever that he has prepared for. Thank you so much, Mr. Morita. You're welcome. Over to you, Blaubi, Dr. Ishmael Dodu. Um, I don't know what your nickname was when you were when you were in Accra Academy, but hopefully you tell us that. And everyone is ready to hear from our ACE presenter tonight. Over to you, Blobi Ishtodori. Kindly unmute your microphone, sir. 
Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm very delighted to be here. I can see a lot of new, uh, some, some old faces who are here, some of my classmates that I, I spent time with in Accra Academy, and that is very refreshing. Uh, I just want to salute some of them, um, particularly those who, who I, reckon, I reckon as um, individuals that have made significant contribution to, to my journey to here. I see my classmate, um, Manajasu Alawabu. I see Libabs over there. I see uh, Ni Aya. <laughs> um, and there's a host of others, Yanabai and Koa coming. Uh, they used to call me Bronze, but it was a made up name. Uh, I, I rather became known as Brother Boom when I went to a University of Science and Technology, which is something that I might talk about on the way. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I also have uh, one of my senior brothers, Mr. Jamie Fee, who is on the line as well. Then I just want to thank you. Uh, quite frankly, as I'm preparing to come here uh, and to share some thoughts with you, um, one, my rector, who is also the founder of the only African scholarship in Linica College in Oxford, and uh, who was also worked with me and some of my other graduates who set up a scholarship trust fund, um, which is tenable in Ghana at the moment uh, for bright needy students. He volunteered to also come online and to say hello to us. I remember that, so I recall some of you have asked about, you know, how do you get to Oxford? So if, if I see him online, I might give him an opportunity to share a few thoughts, but he really had made significant contribution to Africa. Um, so to begin with, I just want to thank all of you, um, and I, I want to really thank God for this opportunity. I've never dreamt that I will have this opportunity to come and share my life, my life story, and to sort of extract some of the lessons I've learned, which have enabled me to over overcome some challenges and turn them into opportunities to be where I am today, that uh, graciously and with all humility, uh, we all celebrate and we have many more others in, in a Blow B fraternity who has celebrated. Also, Keith Lloyd is here, and Keith, I just mentioned your name, and please, let's, let's give some commendation to Dr. Keith Lloyd, who founded the Norma Lloyd Scholarship, Tenable in Linica College in Oxford University. Keith, thank you very much for, for your wonderful contribution to Africa, and also for the mentorship of me. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to start by also, really um, projecting this opportunity to solemnly thank God for, for giving me this, this grace to be here, and particularly uh, for a man of faith such as I am, that we really thank Jesus Christ who has been my mentor, my spiritual mentor in days that I have been very much uh, left alone, who have given me everything that I need to know and have taught me to, to have taught me the, the values of integrity, of honesty, of, of God, in, God in living, which has brought me here. So I really want to thank God for, for this opportunity. So, Blobby, um, we have to do it the Accra Academy style, I've been told. <laughs> so as a gamma, sometimes I'll throw in some of my, uh, my slogans, uh, such as gymnastic blocks and so on. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, how do you all start? It all started from, primary school called St. Mary's Anglican School. You know, I was born in a place called uh, Amamomo, which is a twin place with a, a, another place called Adelempo. In that environment, what you have there is you have um, a, a, a private school, which is attended by quite, uh, you know, people with, with good money uh, in the middle, middle class. Then you also have uh, some of the very poor primary schools in the environs, which uh, the poor, the poor uh, families tend to tend their kids. And then you have the, the Anglican churches that have also started school. So my parents who are Anglican, school, Anglican church decided to send me to St. Mary's Anglican Primary School. Now St. Mary's Anglican Primary School is about 10 minutes walk to Buko Park. 70% of my classmates live in Gamashi area, which is constituents of the Ododojiojo constituency. Now the Ododojiojo constituency is famous for for the Gang community, it's a fishing community. Uh, the St. Mary's Anglican Primary School is primarily uh, Gang children who go, who go there. So I spent my formative years actually, uh, you know, playing football at Bukom, going to a place called Fase and uh, to Saraga Market, 
and to places like that. And this is how I've, I've come to, because most of my formative years, the friends that I have uh, are in Bukom. So I call, we call ourselves the, the Bukom boys, the Bukom elites, <laughs> and we're very proud of ourselves about that. But one of the things that is very, very uh, interesting is the construct of the community and what community has to offer to you in terms of what you take into your livelihood and your future career or what you don't take. Um, and because the challenges and obstacles in such a community which has very high poverty rate, which have very high English literacy rate, um, which have um, parents who can't afford too, too much and therefore you probably go to school with um, one uniform uh, per year uh, and the one, one shoe that you use and if you spoil it, then through football, such as what I used to do, then I'll have to wait till Christmas when I'm given another shoe. <laughs> um, so, so you have these obstacles. And also you have a very high population, which means that the fertility rate is very high. Um, and every now and then there is, there is what you call the aldering ceremony, um, which, which causes the, a lot of pandemonium and also uh, waking. And uh, so the place is very noisy. Uh, and then what also you have there is that most people don't afford electricity very much. And so uh, doom so for us is, is normal. Uh, and we have, to, we have to study with lanterns. And I'll tell you some of, the, some of how I come to actually wear glasses apart from genetics that I have to learn, I have to learn and, uh, with lanterns or, uh, or candles, uh, especially when I'm preparing for exams. So at St. Mary's uh, Anglican Primary School, this is where it all started. And it started in a community called the Jodi uh, constituency with uh, Adedempo, Amamomo, Bukom, Fase, Salaka. These are areas that I had found myself. And in those areas, one of the things that I, I learned very quickly is that you have good names such as uh, then Azozo, who was uh, a formidable uh, lawyer. You also have uh, my, my late father who, who played the uh, Accra as a folk and also played uh, the, the Black Star and won the Black Star of African Cup trying for Ghana. Um, and then you also have, um, uh, on the, you also have, you know, good footballers and, and good boxers and sports people and all the mix. So on one hand, you have people that have actually made names. And on the other hand, you also have the abject poverty. So it is basically, you are faced with these two contrasting situations that you need to pick out of your community. And I chose, I chose um, to actually become somebody. So I remember when I started primary school where they teaching us in, in, in fact, in mathematics, English and everything, they have to start with a gun language to then interpret it for us to understand and then we get, get going. Um, I, I, earlier on, because of the people, the friends that I play, used to play in the community, most of them uh, have attended primary school and uh, private school, and they are doing what we call verbal quantitative. They, some of them are learning English, uh, and they speak very, they speak very good English. And these are people that I play with when I go home from school. So I decided to teach myself how to read and write. Um, um, and what was very interesting was that the Ghana language lends itself to learning the vowels and how to put letters together to pronounce words in English. So I was able to start reading, but without really understanding what I read. So in primary school, um, as I kept going, as I kept doing that and then engaging with my, my friends, ma mainly for me to just fit in, because otherwise I'll be recognized as, uh, you know, guy going to the public school, who uh, can't speak English. And I didn't want that because I was doing very well in my primary school. So it's all, it went on and on until uh, when I got to class four, uh, class three, um, and then going to class four primary, <laughs> that um, the teachers noticed that I was very, very smart because I've been pressed all through and, and that I could actually understand some of the advanced classes and so they jumped me from class four to class six. At the point I was jumped, uh, the first term I was third in class, and then the second term I was first in class. 
Um, and then from there on, um, I wrote an exam at Kimbo Experimental Junior Secondary School to then become, um, uh, to go to Kimbo Junior Secondary School. Now, again, when I got to uh, class six, the obstacle I faced was I met with people who were well advanced, quite some of them, Joshua Alabi, uh, Joshua Lalai, boys, my, my, my close first friend that I grew up with, we challenged each other. I was very good in mathematics, in fact, just now an engineer. Very good in mathematics, and, uh, and I was very good in English, and also uh, to some extent mathematics. And so we would just learn and help each other. And he came from across the, the street from the school called the uh, 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 Ulebu area. So then um, we, we forced ourselves to go and pick the, the exams you know, uh, forms in Kimberley Experimental Junior Secondary School, and we went, we went to write the exam, so we considered, and thankfully, three of us were actually considered at Kimberley Experimental Junior School. It was when I got to Kimberley Experimental Junior School that I realized how hard I need to work in order to overcome my, my obstacle, because uh, at the time, uh, Ghana was going through significant challenges. You remember that in the Rollins' time, yeah, that was in the 80s. Uh, we had the structural adjustment program. Uh, people were told we are queuing for food, uh, for bread, and so on. There was a PNDC era, uh, and there was massive retrenchment. So my father, who was, uh, you know, bringing home money, and my mom's uh, business, you know, the most popular women suffered a lot. Of course, uh, it was retrenched. So when I was at Cambridge Junior Secondary School, I had to go and sell a uh, scarf at the end of class. Uh, so I can get money to pay my fees. I skip a lot of the fees and sometimes they will not allow you to write exams. You have to go and beg them to allow you in to write exams. Sometimes in order to allow you, you didn't do anything, but the teacher will give you five lashes in your back and you take the lashes and you go and write exams. And I, one of the things that kept me going was my vision and my desire that one, one day I want to be a neurosurgeon. And uh, why, why did I want to be a uh, neurosurgeon? Because <laughs> um, at the time, we heard a lot about one proliferating neurosurgeon called um, uh, Dr. Mustafa. And um, in my quest to, to learn to, how to read and write, what I do is that anything I found on the ground, I read. When I find a uh, graphic, I read. When I see anything, when I walk, I read billboards and so on, to the point where my parents thought that I was actually going crazy. So they wanted to take me to psychiatry hospital to check whether I was sane. <laughs> but it was, it was simply because it was just my, my curiosity. And there was one moment I was reading and I saw his name. So I decided to follow uh, and ask uh, people who know him. And there were some in my community who Profess that they know where Dr. Mustafa is. And my father told me that or when he used to play football at Nima, he used to kind of watch him and so on. So uh, I just said, uh, one day I want to be a neurosurgeon and then I want to work for WHO, UN. So it was that dream. I didn't know if this would happen, but it was that dream that kept me pushing myself to learn the arts, to learn the sciences, and, and in particular to push myself to, to, to fit in. Um, and so I would go and sell get some money and then pay our fees by my, my school, my school textbooks uh, and so on. Um, and, as, and, and I had to wake up at 4 a.m., do all my chores, set my mom up and pass her dress up and then go to Kimber Cemental Junior Secondary School. One thing that was very interesting that touched me uh, one day was I had, I had gone back two years ago to, to uh, pass her dress up to, to the same spot where I used to draw get the, the, the scarf and go and sell. And, um, <laughs> and then the, I, I got to one spot that I really recognized after many decades of, of being there with my mom, that I, I, I recognized the place. I went straight to the place and I started looking around and this lady saw me and said, and, and spoke in gun, brother. So I turned and I said, oh, fine, yes, I told him, brother, till your turn. I said, my name is Brother Ian, how are you? Okay. Oh my, oh, Brother Bufu no Panekeni, oh, Nkaibu. And then, you know, she told me, this is Auntie, Auntie uh, Akwele, who would make sure that you go to school early and so on. Oh my God. 
it was an emotional moment. And I told him where I'm working. I showed him, I showed her, my, my children. And I said, I just come to see the, I'll see a familiar face here to be very grateful. I'm feeling emotional now to be very grateful for the things that most of you have done for me. And it was at that moment that I realized that I could not take anything for granted in life. So fast forward, uh, Kimbo Junior Secondary School. This is where my story where I crack and then happened. In fact, um, let me let me give a flashback. When I was at when I was at um, St. Mary's, we used to go during Easter Easter Mondays. We used to go to Accra Academy for for to play. To play. You know, we have uh, this. We call it Ajabe. <laughs> Those of you who are familiar with uh, Ajabe, and it is just a moment where you go and enjoy yourselves. And there are um, you know, people will cook, they play football, they play games, there's competition between churches and so on and so forth. Yeah. And, and, and as, as I was, I was, I was, we we'll go to a crack academy, I would always go and stand a particular class, which is, which when I joined the crack, it was class 2D. And I would pray, God, give you an opportunity to be here. I've admired this school and I wanted to be part of this school. But I was told that, well, you know, this is, you need to have a certain grade. You didn't go to a, a private school. And so, you know, it would take you a long time to get to a place like this. Um, and uh, you are very, from a poor home and uh, this would be quite difficult. Um, <laughs> so one day when I was in uh, from two at Kimbo Experimental Junior School, school that my father woke me up at dawn and said, you're going to attract me to write exams. And if you pass, you go to that school. And this is what happened. This is how I got to a crack. And I went to write the exams and I passed. And it was a supplementary list of, uh, of students that they were recruiting. And God to this, I joined class today. And when I joined class today, my first person I met was Alabo, who is online, uh, Jasu, and Godwin Akaga. Alabo then was a class pre prefect, and Godwin Akaga was the uh, deputy. And these became my friends that were helping me to settle. Uh, it was quite difficult to settle at the time because I came with uh, one a self-esteem problem. I'm coming from uh, the Dodo constituency. I'm coming from uh, um, I'm coming from Kimbo Experimental Junior Secondary School. Uh, but then when they started the mathematics, I was way ahead. So then everybody started noticing me, and this is how I got I got into into the class. Um, and um, one thing went, you know, when one thing led to the other led to the other, and I did quite well. And uh, through the formatives of Accra Academy, I went to uh, have a uh, distinction. And um, then I, managed, I got opportunity to go to uh, University of Science and Technology. And in my days in University of Science and Technology, um, I, I was a student uh, leader, joined the National Union of Ghana students as a local groups representative, uh, and a member of the Student Representative Council. I was a president of the a group called the Literary Wing, which is one of the biggest uh, literary arts group in the in the university, and uh, that's where I got my name, Brother Boom, uh, for for a play that I acted a certain role called Brother Boom in it, and um, and I played quite an impressive role in the, in the university, in fact, um, through student politics to uh, Christian politics, um, and then I, I I came out with the first class honors. Now, uh, when I came out of first class honors, I at the end of the university, I look for I look for a job. I would I want to recognize here that we live in a country where it is really difficult um, to get a job after you know, after school. Uh, studies have shown that the first the average number of years you spend um, in order to be able to get. Uh, a job for the land, a job for the first time is between three to five years. So I really, I really uh, recognize that. Um, I have some ideas about how we can overcome some of those obstacles. What I do is that uh, after I move through, I'll come up with some ideas about some of the obstacles and how how overcome them, and then we can have a conversation uh, about the future. So uh, from from then, uh, I applied to school uh, to a job. And in fact. I remember I attended one interview and they told me, we could give you the job, but we don't want to be the big thing that you are too academic, you're too clever, you might probably, probably lead us uh, if we invest in you. 
So I would they, they say I would encourage you to go to your university and, and teach. <laughs> I'm glad that I didn't get that job. But um, subsequently, I joined Ghana Wildlife Society and I did some good job there. And in, in the work during Ghana Wildlife Society that I, I had a chance meeting with a professor from Oxford University who introduced me uh, to the course. And he said, well, uh, you know, there is one scholarship for Africa tenable in Lincoln College, which Dr. Kit Lodge um, uh, graciously has set up. And I competed for that scholarship, one scholarship for Africa. And by the grace of God, I got into Oxford. And when I went to Oxford, uh, I did quite well and was featured in the prestigious uh, Oxford Annual Review for being an outstanding uh, graduate student. Um, in the midst of this, uh, from Oxford, I got a job as a private sector person I was working. And um, through, uh, through the discussion, uh, through my work, uh, I got to a moment, inflection moment, where I felt that um, I needed to pursue my dream. So I, I, I saw that uh, UNDP, UN Development Program, and they have what is called the Leadership Development Program, which is a, was extremely competitive. 6,500 applicants, and they will select uh, 10 to 15, and one slot is only for an African graduate. I competed for that, and by the grace of God, this is how I joined the UNDP. And through the UN, I've served in several uh, leadership roles, um, both in Africa and also to support the High Office of Secretary General. And I've, I've wielded several, several different roles uh, in different places. And it's brought me the opportunity to interact, not just with heads of state, but dignitaries and also interact with a wide range of individuals from who are leading grassroots movement, uh, individuals who make significant transformational challenge, changes in their communities, um, CEOs, and so on and so forth. So in a nutshell, this gives you uh, a snapshot of, of, of the journey that I, I went through. Now, I want to say that it has not been, as you can see, uh, being able to pursue a dream from where I came from to where I am today uh, requires that you need to have some tenacity to obstacle to overcome some obstacles. The obstacles I was faced with, one was the fact that I'm a gun coming from that community. There's a label on you, wherever you find yourself, whether you went to uh, uh, and find yourself in Accra Academy or through uh, you know, the, the, the places that I, I was, you still have these, these challenges of self-esteem. You still have these challenges of doubting yourself and say, could I really overcome these challenges? Uh, you still have your, your environmental challenges, that how many people could you look up to? Majority you see are footballers or boxers or pursuing some kind of uh, talented skills. Uh, but very few uh, really reside in that environment that actually have excelled. Not to say that there are many guns that have really excelled, but most of them live outside the environments where they are So then who are your mentors? Who are the people that you will look up for? One of the things that helped me was uncles helped me to shape my character. They realized that I was very academically astute and smart. So I had uncles that would prevent me from playing football. When they see me playing football and I, they will ask for the first question, have you finished your homework? If I, I was hesitating, they will ask me and take me home, make sure I shall, I shall sit down. I'll sit down and do my homework. I'm very grateful to them because they helped me to be very focused um, and, and, and to be able to pursue my dream. Um, and um, the other challenge you, you have is also um, that, you know, even when you want to push forward, you are faced with this reality. What is the reality? The reality is really uh, this issue about financing. Uh, um, I remember that even when I graduated from my academy with a distinction, I hadn't finished paying my, uh, the rest of the fees, even though I was on bursaries. So I have to go by back door to know uh, what my results were uh, before these were paid. So you did have these significant challenges. And these challenges in my nature simply be because my father was retrenched and my mom was there so winner you know, and we have you know, five children at home and we have to look at all those people after all those. So you, you have this challenge and there are many that are bright that still have these kind of challenges. Now, how do I overcome some of these challenges? I've come up with some lessons. 
And this obeys on my critical reflection of my journey. And it's also, uh, it also has some contribution of pe from people that I've spoken to, uh, who were my mentors, uh, who have gone through significant adversities to be very successful. The first is you need to have a power of purpose. You know, anyone who has a power of purpose, who has a sense of purpose, has something to go for. For me, even if I didn't realize that dream and I thank God where I am today because, you know, I'd rather be where I am um, uh, to be a neurosurgeon. You know, this is, this neurosurgeon idea, the fact that I could become, uh, because I was, I, was, I was doing well in school, being commended for my excellence and so on, I, I believe that, look, this, I could make it. So it was something that gave me meaning, something that pulled me into the future. It was, it was a thing that influences, influenced me to make the right choices. So it was these peoples of this grand idea of what I want to become in the world, that I want to become a researcher, work for the WHO and work and in, work in, 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 in the in global environment. Those things, even though I didn't know whether it is, it is achievable, that grandiose feeling. I remember I could walk on the streets and feel and reading and be pretending to be, uh, to be that person. And I remember one, one of my friends, Ralph Aya, who is here, and then Lawrence, and then I used to tell them that one day I'd like to be a, a world humanitarian, a reverend doctor, I would just call myself. And, it, and we'd go to Oxford and I would pretend giving speeches when we're learning. I didn't know that these things were all a manifest, a prophetic manifestations of what I was doing. So have a sense of purpose where everyone is born for a purpose. It, irrespective of where you are today in life, there is something that is meaningful for you. That's why you were brought on earth. You need to pursue that. The second lesson is self-confidence. I mean, I could not talk about it without talking about the, 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 the need to have self-confidence. Self-confidence for me, the way I gained it was, I did not neglect the small daily disciplines. Homework, I'll sit down and actually will, 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 will listen, will, will, will do my homework. Um, I was very studious. Uh, even when I play football, I come home before I bath, how to do my homework and go and bath. Um, so I, I set goals for myself and I was very disciplined in ensuring that I would achieve those things on a daily basis. You achieve it on a daily basis, on weekly, on monthly, then you have a sense of fulfillment. I remember that uh, I would take our, uh, our textbook and I want to solve a mathematical problem. And if I couldn't solve it, I would not eat, I would keep doing it until I solve it. So my, my willingness to, to do whatever I took, and in fact, when I was going to university, um, I had to go outside of my comfort zone with my dad to go and talk to people to tell me the various disciplines and where they are leading me to. Because if I was faced with a stark reality, I could not go to medical school. I just did not have the money, even though I could compete to go there. So I have to look at alternative disciplines. So I was faced with pharmacy, which I didn't like, biochemistry, I didn't like, biological sciences, which would give me an urge to go to uh, university. Probably, and then in my conversation, um, and one of my was senior uh, Akrakan uh, boys. His name is uh, we call him Sedu. And Sedu said to me, um, "We go to church together." He said, "Why don't you consider natural resources?" And he said, "What does it mean?" And he explained the cause that this is a cause that is is, is actually where the world is lead, leaning towards at the moment. Uh, with environmental governance, environmental policy, natural resources, forestry, and so on. And you will do very well there because you're meticulous, you're a science student, and you, you will have this passion. So I got interested, and then I went to speak to uh, someone who had graduated from natural resources, Kwamina. And Kwamina, you know, he was also a crack academic boy, uh, and, and he gave me the inspiration. So this is how I applied to natural resources. And I, I really, I was very happy that I did that. So self-confidence. Don't neglect the small daily disciplines. I believe you need to have the ability to rise above your circumstances, to pursue your goal, pursue your vision, pursue your purpose, self-confidence. And the moment you achieve those daily little things, I'm telling you, your, search, your sense of achievement will continue to spur you on onto other things. So the third one is enthusiasm. 
And here I'm not talking about enthusiasm that is generated out of excitement. I'm talking about enthusiasm that is generated out of motivation to see something that when you are finished, somebody will say congratulations. And this is how I pursue my life. Inside me, I learn to build enthusiasm for pursuit of my goals and achievement and high achievement. And it was 90% of whatever I would look for. I would fight to get to the top. I will fight to make sure that I excel. I don't do it at the expense of people. I do it at the expense of myself. Whatever it would take for me to push myself. I push myself to learn how to speak English. I push myself to learn to read. And so I got jumped from class four to class six. I push myself. And those are the things. And when I look back and I, and I said to myself, wow. Those were things, those are things that I, I, I have, I continue to take into my future. Um, so enthusiasm that people are looking out to you, people are cheering you on, people really, a lot of people are looking out to you and you, their life might be dependent on you. Just, just where you are, if you can look at the bigger picture and the bigger dreams and pursue that with tenacity, with confidence, with humility, with that self-discipline and that enthusiasm can bring you in, you excel. The other thing is, ask yourself, what does it, what does it take for me to arrive there? Expertise, excellence in, in skills. You want to excel in all variables that helps you to become who you are. You, have, you want to build on your soft skills, your planning skills, your speaking skills, your engagement skills. You, you want to build on anything that adds value. You read the right kind of books to give you the ideas that help you to lean towards where you want to go. You must invest in those things. Invest in expertise. The next thing that I think that was useful is preparation. You know, I can get you ready for whatever dream that you're looking for. Every dream, every dream needs preparation. And, and you know, decisions that you make during this time of preparation, will last for a lifetime. And beyond the, the, the bigger thing about preparation is actually to prepare for success. You know, life, does, I, what I've found out is that life, it doesn't matter where you come from. And in fact, a lot of people that have actually excelled and achieved greatly have come from very humble beginnings. So our story, so this story may be just one of millions of stories. Um, as, 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 as unique as it may sound, but your story could be part of this story as well. It could be like this story where you, you, you prepare yourself to attain the highest achievement that you're looking for. You do that by making sure that you don't, you don't waste your, tell, your, your, your time and resources on bad things. You have, life does not give you what you wish, does not give you what you desire, it gives you what you deserve. And those who pay for those, they get it. You know, you know, you hear about the concept of sowing and reaping. You know, you want bright ideas, look for it. You want to know how to overcome your obstacles, search for it. If you seek, seek, you will find. And this is all part of the preparation. And I think one of the things that is very useful in my community at the time growing up was that we had this community support to help you to prepare. I, I told this story, you know, when I was in university, um, every time I was, I was going to go to school um, <laughs> my provisions, which is what you get for your, your full staff and so on, they come, they always come for me. They always come <laughs> a night before I travel. So I will wake up and um, my mom will come, bring those things and I'll put them in my chalk box and so on. And in fact, by the way, I got a suitcase for the first time when going to university. Normally we're using trunk. <laughs> and for those of us in Chacho in uh, Krakow, we're using trunk. So you can, you can check what what I'm talking about. But one of the things that the community did for me, which was fantastic, it was also an emotional moment for me, was that dawn before I leave to, to take the state transport corporation. They will come with Gary, with Olonka of Shito, with um, uh, you know, pr uh, milk, with uh, Kiso, and, they will, and these mothers will say, this is all we've given you, for, and this is our contribution to your life. Because we know that one day you will grow and you become a king. And those words encouraged me and they inspired me on. And I looked at those as aids towards my preparation. And you know, 
I've never forgotten those women. Uh, they, most of them have passed away, but each time uh, I think about them, whenever I go home and see their family, I'm very grateful. So, depression. The last, the next one that I will be one of the one of things that will leave us with, and we can talk more because I will be able to answer specific questions. Is character. A man without character cannot go anywhere. The world is looking for people who are selfless, who, in, who have integrity, who are honest. You cannot continue to, to do what you're doing uh, that you know are very toxic to life. If you keep doing those things, you know the end. You know, you can predict success and you can predict failure. One of the things that is very true throughout all my life and through my, particularly where, where I am now, is character. The image you project, your values, the things you do when people don't look for you. So you have to think about it. What kind of man or woman do I want to be? And how do I measure that with my with the integrity that goes with it? What do I need to change in order to attain that level? I have seen people who have lost it at the very peak of their career because of current. As a matter of fact, I was in a meeting um, and I with a share of the cabinet of uh, Secretary General Bank and I was called as a witness to the meeting. And here was an undersecretary, undersecretary general who was labeled with, uh, with, with, uh, with allegation, a 10 point allegation by staff. The majority of it has to do with weak character. And he was defending himself, a man at the peak of his career under Secretary General. And he lost his job. And that is when I realized that of everything that you look for, a man of character will stand the test of time. And, and, and this is what I want to, to, to leave with you. My story could be your story. And it could be a story that you will tell. The journey has just begun. And I believe that all of us in, a, in the ecosystem of Accra Academy will be. We have a lot to achieve, a lot to give to our country. It doesn't matter where you are. If you take these little steps, strengthening your purpose, building your self-confidence, preparing for success, changing your character, strengthening the things that you need to change, change them today, building discipline, consistent applications of those values. I can tell you, you will see the opportunities that are in your environment. You'll be able to develop those opportunities that are in your environment. You will become the entrepreneur that you're looking for. The sky is not even the limit. The sky is just something you envisage because you can hit beyond it. You will not break ceilings, but you will actually keep going higher and higher. Because look, the opportunities abound for Africans to take. And a man who positioned him Self for those opportunities, I have no doubt will be able to achieve greatly. Thank you. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, I wish we could all clap for you, but that's really not possible right now. But please know that you have done a great job uh, with this amazing presentation. You have said a lot of things. I've made a few notes. You have said to have purpose and to be disciplined build a self-confidence, have enthusiasm, develop expertise, prepare, 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 because life does not give you what you desire, but life gives you what you deserve. And you have crowned it by saying, a man without character cannot go anywhere. A man without character cannot go anywhere. And character you have explained to be our integrity, to be our hard work, to be our honesty. Look, I, 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 I can only say thank you. Thank you for really summarizing this uh, very nicely. There have been a lot of comments. Uh, I'll read a few of them. And then I will, I will start the question and answer session. And please, before I go into the comments, this is for everyone. To be able to ask a question, you need to use the raise hand uh, tool in Zoom. Once you do that, I will recognize you appropriately. You will unmute your mic, ask your question, and you mute your
your mic again. And please make the questions very succinct, straight to the point, straight to the point. So, Blobby uh, Nido, a lot of people have said great things about you in the comments. Great presentation, kudos. Um, someone said, I cannot hide my amazement uh, as this great blow product who is a class class P. Um, and then someone also said, uh, you, were, you were number one in biology in class. I was surprised when you and Lamte traded places. Uh, I expected Lamte to be working on subatomic particles. Uh, Science One and Akraka was full of talents. I am glad you joined us in D class. Uh, there, there is one other one I really want to read for you. And this is from the last session he says, uh, he or she says, the positive of Malitoba is a result of question mark, please. <laughs> so you need to unmute your mic, uh, Dr. Dodu. Uh, so the positive <laughs> of Malitoba is a result of Anachronism, discuss. Anachronism, awesome. <laughs> okay. So having listened to your almost um, inspiring story, I want to kickstart the question and answer session. If there is a blobby who's been out of school for years, um, has the burden of raising a family, um, but is still not at the place where they want to be, they're beginning to feel a sense of despair um, nothing seems to be working. As much as they can, they have exhibited some character. How else can they turn their fortunes? Wow. This is a, this is a, this is a, a very um, interesting question. In the, and it is a question of, of morality. Um, first, I want the Blobby to understand that uh, having done everything you can, but it seems like uh, life had not dealt well with you. Um, it does not mean that um, everything is lost. There may be a, a nugget somewhere that you may look for. And the way I will look out for this is I will, I will have a deep reflection and ask myself, what have I been doing continuously which is not working? Maybe you try some trade and the trade is just not working, but you keep trying it and it's not working and it gives you debt and you keep trying. Maybe you have to change and look at something else. The second thing I'll ask myself, what skills do I have that I can add value on and sell? You know, we live in society where everybody eats food, everybody wears clothes, and uh, society where people need services, um, particularly when you, 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 know, you are able to provide services to people living in, uh, if you like, uh, Trasaco Valley and so on and so forth, places where people are very busy and they will need someone to simply go and pay their electricity or pay their water bills or pay something. The point I'm trying to arrive at is look at what society needs in terms of service and develop something that it can do to help them. Could it be that you would um, simply establish a, a water area and, and then bring that people can come and wash their cars and they pay for something? Or could it simply be that you you able to pay people's uh, you know, those who are busy, you can go, you can pay for the electricity and be paid for the services that you offer. Think about what you can do with your, with the skills that you have. And if it means that uh, the more, what you wanted to do means that you need to add value to your skills, then try and look for those. And the third thing is look at the Blobby ecosystem. People have needs, they will need services, for, but we never ask them. We never ask them. Okay, for example, somebody may want um, uh, someone to always pick his car on weekends, go and wash it and pay for it. Or somebody may want, uh, because he or she is busy, he wants someone to do chores for them and pay for it. So can you imagine that you have 10 people who you go to market, or markers, or you go and shop for, they give you the list and go and shop for them, and then they pay you, they, pay you, they pay you for 20 Ghana a day for five days. You're talking about uh, 100 Ghana. So for, for a month, you're making your 400 Ghana or 500 Ghana. And this is just for, for one person. If we're doing that for five people, you'll be making 2,500 Ghana. So let's not 
when we are faced with adversity, you have two things for you. Either you use the adversity as a calamity, in which case you sit down and, and you allow things to pass by, or you use it as a bridge. And to use it as a bridge is to ask yourself these questions that I just asked. What does it teach me? What lessons have I learned? What skills do I have now? What can I do with myself? Uh, what do people need that I can be of service for that doesn't require that I show certificate or anything? And uh, if you ask those questions quite well, uh, my brother, you would see that you will see some solutions coming to you. And, and let me tell you, when you make that effort, uh, you, would, you would reap the benefit. Because the law of seeing, uh, sowing seed and, and, um, and, uh, and reaping will work for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me put a little twist. So I have some hands up and I'll definitely call them. First, I want to read out a comment to you. So far, really very impressed with engagement skills of the speaker, which is you. Uh, it's not very easy connecting with people on a virtual platform. Chapeau, monsieur. Okay, uh, that's to you. you. But let me put a little a little twist on the question I asked earlier. So you have this Blaubi who was your classmate, right? Uh, right. Again, same scenario, life hasn't dealt too well with them. But when we were in school, they were the brightest of the brightest. Something must have gone amiss somewhere. Yeah. Now they have descended into, you know, that space where they've lost confidence and all how do you bounce back i, I like that you said reevaluate and everything but there should be some starting points somewhere what do you consider the most feasible i think the most practical one is to connect to the ecosystem of the year group our okay. year group are really doing very well um noting and there are no situations where they have come 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 through with people so please okay. connect to your year group and and I'm very happy to have a private conversation with a person, know the year group, see what the ecosystem will offer. Uh, but before the ecosystem offers something, we need to know what his passion is for the person. I'm a clever student, but this is somebody that has some good skills, good ideas, uh, good enthusiasm. Um, and this, he has some values that we can actually sharpen and help him to. Well, once the uh, what he or she wants to do, then we can find practical solutions. If it means developing a business plan and putting him to start and somebody is providing, making sure that he can pay back what is learned him or so on, then we can continue to do that. Okay, but if you know, the other thing is when you come in and you, you are not even interested in changing your situation, there's no way you know, you know, I can help you. You need to recognize that in order to be different, you need to change. And that's very important. And it's a very okay. tough, tough thing to do. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Doc. Uh, let's go to Kwame. Kwame, um, I see your hand up uh, and make your comment. Uh, thank you, Yao. If you can hear me, I just want to say thank you to uh, Dr. Ishmael Dodu for the presentation. Uh, in fact, I've actually um, taken the liberty of sending you an invite on LinkedIn. I hope we can connect and learn a bit more. Um, yes. I'm actually um, referring to one of the uh, profiles that you have on LinkedIn, which is that you currently work for the, the UN Secretary General Special Advisor for the Sahel. Um, incidentally, we had a conversation yesterday uh, with a group of people talking about what is currently happening in Mali. Um, I wonder what you are currently doing on that particular front. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so on a professional note, <clears throat> the, the UN integrated strategy for the Sahel encompasses the 10 countries that, the, that, con that constitute the Sahel. Uh, the G5, which is Mali, Burkina Faso, Maur uh, Mauritania, Chad, and Niger. And then the other five, uh, which is uh, Senegal, Gambia, Nigeria, Cameroon, and uh, um, I mentioned Mauritania. Yeah. So you have these uh, uh, 10 countries that comprises uh, the Sahel. Um, the epicenter of the problem in the Sahel is actually in Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. Why are they epicenter? Because 
Um, that's where you have the violent extremism, the, Boko, the jihadist movement, the, the huge of, uh, drug, uh, drug trafficking. Uh, security uh, crisis is completely uh, devastating the place because Mali, in the question of Mali, Mali, uh, these three, they, they three also border themselves. The, where they border is where the, the, the fighting is. Mali has a, has a peculiar problem. 60% of the land is actually desert. Um, and um, majority of the of the violent extremists have actually occupied those places, uh, and they are controlling uh, drug trafficking. They're controlling um, terrorism. Uh, they're controlling. They're controlling. Um, uh, you know, mineral resources and so on and so forth. So you are, the country is faced with uh, two things: one, having to spend significant part of their budget to buy arms and to, and to fight this. And living in living a country with a very little amount of, of money to address the societal problems that the citizens are faced. And on top of it, you have the citizens being bastardized by the, by the violent extremists in terms of killing, uh, you know, decapitations and so on and so forth. So uh, the, 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 the problem there is complicated. And when you have a situation like that, get different opposition forces. So what you are seeing is a symptom of mistrust of government, mistrust of the leadership ability to actually protect citizens and to actually stabilize the country. Um, and so this is what we need to stay um, and, um, But we're working very hard. Uh, leadership, uh, you see ECOWAS was selected, um, has a state including Nana to go and brainstorm and have discussion with the opposing forces to find a middle ground. Um, it is not going to be easy, but I think that this is also a classic case where a country needs to take their, their they have to take their, their responsibility. Um, they have to be able to ask themselves, how could we as a country join and be united to fight this many? And I think if they have done that, they'll be able to make significant um, uh, they may, they will really be able to make significant changes to the country. Thank, Thank you. you um, in the interest of time, we would, would like to bundle the questions so that you okay. can take them together. The, let me go on to the questions in the comment box and then I'll come to Albert. Uh, so two questions. Good evening, my question, what are you doing to contribute to the economic development of our country? Please, not remittances, we need such fine brains as well. That's uh, one question. The second one says, hi, thanks for the opportunity to participate in this conference. How do I handle the situation where people perceive you to be not so smart when you're trying to do the right thing amongst crooks? And here he's talking about integrity. Integrity, but how? So those are two questions. Let me take a question from Albert and then you can answer the three together. Albert, you may please unmute your mic. Yeah, thank you so much, Marita. Uh, wonderful presentation by Doc. I personally met Doc last year whilst he was in Ghana. And for me, uh, he's a global citizen. I wouldn't be surprised that in some years to come, we're going to have him as the Secretary General of the UN. Um, Doc, I realize that you have a wide range of mentorship that you do for African youth. I'm looking at how can you create a bias avenue for Blair B to be part of this program that you mentioned over the years. Then secondly, you know, in Africa per se, our society is predominantly an informal sector economy. And we have so many hills within our society. What should the UN do in order to address the issue of poverty within the continent? Thank you. Okay, over to yeah, you, Doc. Thank you, Albert. Ah, thank you very much. Um, let me start from Albert's question. Um, um, Albert's question, which is about mentorship. I think that one of the things that is uh, based on my experience working with grassroots movement and youth across, um, across uh, not just Africa, but uh, but other parts of the world, 
And particularly, I, I belong to a group where I mentor what they call the Adam Star program. These are young entrepreneurs who are developing tools, innovation tools to actually solve society problems. And one of the young, two young men that I'm actually mentor, one is Ugandan and the other is from Bangladesh. These guys are doing amazing work with the, they literally develop innovative platforms um, to help uh, identify the COVID situation and, and link people to where to go for help and so on and so forth. And it's, it's fantastic. And one of the things that I felt is useful to do, and I bet you can, you can, can hold some of us responsible for this, I think we should do that, is, is one, um, mentorship. We need to create mentorship for, for our youth. It's not just enough to have an ecosystem, there will be ecosystem um, where we will meet once in a while, um, you know, for, for games in the university, in the school and we contribute and so on. Like to get the best out of our youth in terms of making them a responsible citizens, they will need to have mentorship. And mentorship is extremely important. We can do it in different ways. What we're doing now is part of mentorship, but active linking people with, with mentors uh, so they can, they, can, they can bounce off ideas of them and they can talk to them, they can mentor them and help them to, to make choices in life, uh, make life, life decisions, learn from mistakes and, and be able to become you know, groundbreaking individuals of purpose and of, of integrity in society is something that we need to look at. And I, I want us to maybe right from this seminar agree that we're going to set up a mentorship scheme across all year group to be able to make this happen. This would be very good. Uh, it would be a great outcome for this meeting. So I'm holding you to it, um, uh, yeah. But the other point is the UN, what we're doing for, to alleviate poverty. I mean, uh, the essence of our work is poverty alleviation. Uh, UN is investing a lot across uh, 196 countries you know, to address particular issue of poverty, what we call the multi-dimensional poverty. Um, poverty uh, is not just one phase, but you look at uh, on lack of access to quality education, lack of access to maybe energy facilities, lack of access to uh, water, access to uh, health and so on. Uh, and then weak governance, weak, um, you know, corruption, index, and we all, all, all those things that are, um, really symptoms of human development that needs to be addressed. UN is investing in those and the UN agencies are looking at it from different uh, perspectives. UNDP looks at it from the development perspective of uh, impact on climate change, uh, uh, rural livelihoods and so on. And then you have UNICEF looking at child poverty, WHO looking at health, um, you have uh, FAO looking at food security. So there's so many that we are doing as a UN. And uh, if you ask me, my role here in the Sahel is also to look at how to turn the Sahel um, from a basket case to a land of prosperity. And one of the achievements that we made uh, working with a special advisor for the Sahel is to change the narrative and to simply inspire hope and optimism that we can do it um, and to get people to believe that it's possible that we can turn the Sahel around. And, you know, just to say that I got this optimism from just my can-do ability from Buko that we will not say no. We cannot say no. Something must change. Where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, and this was even expressed in, the, in my, my contribution to the strategy, the strategy plan for the Sahel. So this is from my side. Now, perception. Ah, this is a very good question because an individual who cannot manage his blind spot have significant challenges. And perception comes from that. The first thing, uh, I'll give some tidbits. Maybe the first thing you need to do is look, pay attention to your behavior that affects others. Maybe there's something you are doing that you are not aware of that is actually creating the perception and engendering it. Uh, you, may, you, you mean well, but perhaps the way you mean well in the, in, in the approach uh, did not give the other person the impression that you do that. So pay attention to those. So have a deep introspective reflection. Um, then the second thing is, you know as an individual, may, uh, behaviors that you may do that may provoke a negative response. So be sensitive to those things. Since people are picking up on you, you need to go the extra mile to be sensitive about things that, that provokes uh, 
negative response. Um, and then the third thing you do is look, change your association, my, bro my brother. Find an association with people that actually are very respected. You know, they said, uh, Berks, show me your, tell me your, 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 they have this thing, bears flock together, bears or the same fair, they, they flock together. Um, you may want to change the perception of you by just associating yourself with the right people that are respected. And I think that would help to manage some of those things. Um, and then the, the fourth thing is, um, you know, don't, don't, don't hide yourself and don't allow it to get to you too much. Um, take it as feedback that is coming from people. And, um, and just work on those three things that I, I, I shared with you. Uh, we'll be able to talk about it some more, uh, if you can side by me and support. I can tell you that we have over 300 uh, medical, uh, we have over 300 beneficiaries, I think. We started from 2000 and, uh, uh, 2008. Uh, our beneficiaries um, have been, yeah, over, 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 over 300, which, about um, 60 of them also be medical students who are in active practice today. Uh, and uh, some of them, some of them, the amazing story, you know, there are some stories of those who have to stop school, the first class student had to stop school to go and sell yam for a year before continuing. But we met the person on by chance and we gave a scholarship this person uh, actually had a first class and they don't, and they went to Oxford University as well. To, to go and do uh, uh, health healthcare, uh, health primary health, and actually a, a PhD students at the moment, and and so there are many stories of that. We uh, test test for Africa and test for Ghana before it have done significant contribution to to the country. Um, maybe we haven't told these stories that, that that it is time for us to do it. And I would say that this scholarship trust is available to Accra academic students who we have come from the background that I come from who without this help will not be able to take up scholarship placement. And uh, please sidebar me, I'll point you to the right direction and, and, and that. And then also I have done personal contribution uh, to the work that Ghana is doing. You, you know that President um, Nanado is the SDG advocate. I said, I was, two of us set this, this thing up when I was in Ban Ki-moon, we gave it to uh, John Mahama and then we gave it to Ghana and it becomes a bona fide property of Ghana for now. And so in my own small way, I supported the setting up of this and to give Ghana uh, that recognition. Um, also in com my community, I contribute uh, recently to a project for the Ghana community uh, response for the COVID. And we, we have raised, uh, uh, you know, PPEs and so on to, to Ghana community hospitals that they are using at the moment. And, and we are at the moment of developing uh, some, some interest, uh, some development initiative uh, aimed at turning, turning around the, the, the literacy in the Ghana community, uh, strengthening uh, entrepreneurship development um, through, through different, different ways. We are in the formative stages, so I don't want to give too much of it, but this is something that I'm thinking. And then finally, I'll say that my heart is in Ghana. Ghana have done so much for me. I am very indebted. Uh, from my community to university to where I am today. Uh, one thing you can take away from is my book homeness and my ghana -ness. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, so I have a few good hands up. Uh, I'll take one question from the chat and then we'll come to Francis Botha who would ask his question. So the question from the chat, the current curriculum being utilized in Africa was developed for us by outsiders with sole concentration on comprehension and regurgitation. Do you think it is, time to, it is time to develop our own with emphasis on vocational and technical training? Is this a concern at all to African leaders you come in, into contact with? And that's coming from class P. Um, so let's go to Francis Botha. He'll ask his question, then you take those two, and then we'll continue with those who are on. Francis. Right, right. All right, thank you, Anani, and thank you, uh, Blabu Shmeldodu. My question is, I would think it's the high time we have strategy as a topic or as a subject in the high school, in this case, specifically Accra Academy, as an extracurricular activity. 
So by the time we leave school, we have we'll be able to know how to I mean apply strategy in our daily activities as we move forward in life. Thank you. Ah, thank you very much. Um, so let me take the first question on changing the education story. I, I really agree. Uh, a lot of the things that we have inherited from uh, from time of independence to now, uh, and believe it or not, even the template for writing our financial budget have been instituted since 1957. <laughs> yeah, this is why so this is why you can actually sit down and predict what the budget will look like. Uh, so we have inherited many templates which we have no bothered to change. We missed a big opportunity in the 1992 constitutional framework to change many things. And, uh, and we had this constitutional review process at the time, in two, three years ago, which we could have actually taken advantage of to change many things, including questioning uh, our, whether or not our, the way we, we, we look at our governance is appropriate and fit for purpose. Should we have a government, a president nominating everybody and controlling most institutions, even though it's, you are looking at separation of powers? Um, we need to have, we need to have used some reflection to have a very, very deep introspection of where we are and where we want to go as a country. Uh, and whether or not we should even de determine where we want to go and lock it in constitution to allow discussions to happen on the basis of which minds can take us to where we're going. And that applies to our education. Our education must solve problems. Our education must grow the food. My aim at helping us get the, the farmers to grow the food we eat. They must aim at getting our agribusiness sector stimulated so that we will stop in, in importing, for example, uh, $100 million per, per year, year on year from, from Burkina Faso on tomatoes, for example. We're importing billions of dollars on tin tomatoes. Our education must produce the engineers that will construct our roads that will manage our roads. Our education might bring philosophers that can help us to think through problems and go forward, innovators. So clearly, there must be something that we need to change from our curriculum. I remember uh, seven years ago, I, I, I was going to uh, KUNST and I wanted to go back to my uh, department. And, um, uh, and I, I requested to have a friend's notebook uh, uh, notes on a particular subject which I went through when I was in tech. And when I started, from, uh, because you know the way we study is also true and poor, so <laughs> the moment you start reading, you know what is going on. Can you believe, after many years I graduated, I, I was still convinced I can go to tech, learn for one week and still get my first class. I mean, with humility. But this just shows, and Kumla, late Komlan Gumon said that he, he actually did that, that experiment uh, with Lincoln. Nothing has changed. We need to change that. Our education must focus on human capital development, vocational school, critical thinking, those things. Those are the things that, that transform a nation. And we need to focus on that. If we want to build a nation, we need to invest in the critical skills and the talents that our people need to become nation builders. It is not tenable anymore that we live in a country where unemployment rate is very high and youth are so jobless that anything we eat or drink or wear had to be imported. When are we going to break that cycle to create our jobs and industrialization here? We cannot keep mourning. We need to be keep doing. So this is something that is critical. And our edge will be, look, let's mobilize a mass movement against these things about externalities, external parties taking the fortunes of our country. We need to look into it. What can we do? And what can we allow external parties to do? That's very, very important. The other point, uh, the point of our strategy, uh, I would even go beyond that. I think that our, uni our, our high schools, when you are graduating, they should have this, what they call life school. And maybe well, we, we can do that for our cracking. Let's have a live school where we take the graduates uh, into, uh, uh, into rooms for two, three weeks or a month, teach them critical skills for success. Some of the things I've talked about, how do you prepare for success? How do you structure a purpose? How do you think critically about your life? Um, 
then the issue of strategy to be able to overcome uh, life challenges, prepare them into the next step in their life, and a civic education. And the same thing we can do, there will be when we graduate from university, we have a life school. So two strands of life school. One to prepare you to be very successful in university, and the other one is to prepare you to be very successful to the job market. If these two things our aluminum can do, everybody will want to belong to this ecosystem. Because guess what? Pre-university, we will already be seeing the talents. And some of them could go to Oxford, could go to Cambridge, could go to MIT. They don't need to go to KM University. But also after university, some of these, some of these people will have the opportunity to be recruited by our people, some of our guys who are MDs in our jobs. So we will be creating avenues and we'll be adding value to, the whole, to this whole ecosystem of well-being. I challenge us to take that on. And at this evening, I've talked about many things that are challenging, and I hope that we are to keep those things up. Thank you. Yes, I am. And, and thank you. I, I, I wholeheartedly accept the challenge to do the mentoring thing. And I'm noting down all the other challenges. I'll bring them up in the notes uh, post this event. Now, let's go to Na Chocho. Um, your hand is up. Please unmute your mic and deliver your comment. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to uh, greet my brother, Dr. Nido Du. We're very proud of him indeed. Thank um, you, and long may your good work continue to make Ghana proud. To make Bukum proud, to make Bukum prouder still. <laughs> um, secondly, I'd like to raise a, a, an objection purely because uh, uh, from a position of jealousy to the idea that uh, mentorship should only be to blow B. Uh, I know <laughs> that. <laughs> I know that. So I, I will uh, become an honorary blow B so that uh, we can all benefit from this mentorship. But more importantly, my question is this. Um, uh, cities, of course, because of COVID-19, um, has put cities at the front line of coping with uh, its lasting impact. And as we can see, especially in Ghana, um, we have a growing number of uh, rough sleepers, which means that our infrastructures are overburdened and our systems are obviously uh, you know, again, oversubscribed. My question is how is the UN attempting to engage traditional rulership in the implementation, as well as from the policy perspective of the, the sustainable development goals? And I'm glad you, you mentioned it specifically from my point of interest, uh, SDG 11. Uh, how do you think the UN can engage uh, traditional rulership and also uh, the surveying profession to, to better participate in implementing the SDGs as a whole and SDG 11 uh, specifically? Okay, thank you, Na. Uh, let's quickly go to uh, Morrison um, and then we will allow Doc to answer. Straight to the point, Morrison, please unmute your mic. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, great presentation, Dr. Dodd. Uh, my question is straightforward. Uh, number one is, uh, what is your leadership style? And number two is, uh, what leadership style would you recommend in a, in, in a pandemic environment? Like what we have right now uh, is COVID, uh, especially if you are in a, it, 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 uh, like if, if you are in a leadership position, what uh, leadership style would you recommend? to anybody in a leadership uh, position in a pandemic environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morrison. Okay, over to you, Doc. Uh, thank you very much. Um, these are very interesting questions. Oh, my uh, Chocho, I would say, uh, <laughs> you are not okay, huh? question any of the uh, mentorship there. Uh, if I guess we will try and uh, extend it uh, beyond, uh, beyond just a blow. Well, be well, be actually, we are we have women as well now. Yeah, uh, there are women too. <laughs> um, so we we'll invite them, and then we will look at uh, well, be and affiliates maybe. Uh, so by extension, that would be fantastic. And also, 
uh, by affiliates will, will start the benefit of bringing the affiliates' talents as well to bear on this mentorship. The, the more the merrier, uh, with, with focus, so that we don't go all over the place. I, I like focus. Um, the engagement of the traditional rulership in the case of the pandemic um, uh, through the UN and SDG, uh, critically part of the, one of the uh, goals, SDG 11, you right mentioned is about partnership. And by partnership, we look at engagement with all types of groups that they, 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 they highlight. And the private sector is one, uh, but, the, but indigenous people and also the traditional people uh, those who are actually in communities, community-based organizations, who are day to day and on the, at the forefront, at the forefront of uh, of the fight against poverty uh, and sustainable development. Um, so there the, the, the are different ways that we're doing it. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the way we are doing it is we're doing it through different UN agencies, and there are many of them. So um, it would be very useful to know where your interests lie, whether you want to look at it from a development perspective, uh, where in the UNDP may be the, the way to go, or you want to look at it from, uh, uh, as you talk about uh, surveys, uh, I'll remind you that you're looking at um, a sustainable cities perspective, urban planning perspective. So perhaps the UN habitat would be the, the place to, to look at. But I would be, I'll be very happy to point you to the right direction. The third question is about my leadership style. Huh. Uh, this is a very good question and certainly reflecting. My leadership style is, is, um, is one of a desire to, to transform. So I, I, I really like to take interest in the team, the people that I am with. I like to, to really be very observant of their natural skills and their strengths and, and weaknesses so that I will be able to support them to build up on their strength and give them tasks that help them to shine. I always want my team members to shine. I believe that everybody has something to contribute in a team. And it is marvelous when you allow the best of every team member to be expressed. The outcome is fantastic. And you, the leader, you will get to, you know, to enjoy everything. So I really love that. My leadership style is also about service. I, every leader must see is himself or herself as one who serves. And you serve, you serve with, um, um, by, by ensuring that you give something in a state of something. And the way we do it normally is to ensure that, I ensure that, I do normally is to ensure that even if there's a task that we're going to develop, I am very humble to, I'm very humble to learn from you what you think and, and then what ideas I do have. So that whatever we generate becomes owned by all of us. Um, a leader must be very focused and must be very clear on his, um, you know, his instructions. You need to set goals that are achievable uh, and you must set the goals that all of you will own. Um, you must I also like to lead by example. So I try to be the first in my office and the last to lead. And I work very hard. Uh, sometimes it put pressure on my team and we feel that they have to work as hard as I do. But I, you know, I normally will encourage them to go home. Um, and I, I am a very empathetic leader, so I look out for people. Uh, if you come to work and you are devastated, you have problems, I, I will be the first, I, I'll try to see it and then uh, I'll help you out of the situation. I just, in a nutshell, um, I want my team to excel and to excel much, much more better than I have done myself. And I do learn from them. So that's my leadership philosophy and style. Um, in terms of lead pandemic, Leadership pandemic, you know, in a pandemic situation, everything is very urgent. Um, but being very calm is extremely important. So you understand the dynamics and the trends. Uh, one would expect that in a COVID situation, uh, there will be a lot more analysis around, you know, where the epicenters of this uh, COVID situation are. I'm very surprised that. Uh, there haven't been enough conversation about the spread of the book of the pandemic book of thank God that you know a place like that has not been hit. But can you imagine if COVID had broke out in a in a in a similar fashion as it's broken out, it broke out in, in Italy in a place like Buko, uh, Makola Market, Asia uh, Nima. Can you imagine? And why have we, why haven't we as a country actually? 
thought about continuous measures to ensure that these things would not happen. We, we need to plan for it. I don't know, they talk about wave, and I'm not being a prophet of doom, but it's just common sense that you plan for the worst. So in a leadership pandemic, you need to ensure that your team plan for the worst, and they have contingency planning for every scenario. Um, and you must, you know, roll your sleeves and be out there working. Uh, that that the way I see it in the humanitarian setting, in uh, when we manage the Ebola uh, the, as the Ebola focal point, and for this pandemic, that's exactly what we do. The UN is actually establishing uh, treatment centers for the region, and they are doing that. And Ghana is hosting that, so they are actually setting up the treatment center so that when anything happens, uh, you Ghana will be the place that they can fly people in. And we have um, we have. Um, emergency flight that can make sure that we can do that, lift people in a humanitarian setting. So we are prepared for the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, <clears throat> so the, there is a question on the chat and a comment. Uh, I'll take those and then I'll come to Allowable and Albert Quarte, uh, the other two hands uh, remaining. Uh, so Allowable passed the comments. He said, thanks for adding the teaching of critical thinking in answering my question, which was a question on the curriculum. And then there is another comment from Rafael Tete, uh, to whom I am very much indebted. I want to say a big thank you to him because he connected me in getting hold of uh, Dr. Dodu, and I I'm so grateful. I, I believe everybody on this call appreciates uh, the role you've played. He says, in the UK, in the UK education curriculum, we have a subject called PSHE, which is personal, social, and health education. We need a curriculum to address the subject in Ghana, and I'm sure he's making reference to that. Now, this is the most hard-hitting question, so get ready, Doc. This one says, hello, Doc. Thank you for the presentation. My question is this. How much are you involved in AOBA? What are your views on the way the current executive manage AOBA? And lastly, do you plan to take up any leadership role in AOBA? So I told you this is very hard hitting. So let's go to, okay, Alabo is, is not asking a question anymore. Let's go to Albert and then we'll come to you for the responses. Albert, over to you. Yeah, Marita, thanks so much. Doc, um, for me, um, the heartbeat of the sustainable development goals lies in education. You know, like somebody said earlier on, the kind of curricula that we use over here are not fit for purpose. I'm thinking that we should have, we should develop a curricula which will take advantage of our our resources and resources, both human resources and non-human resources. Human resources, we're looking at the talents, we're looking at developing the aspirations, etc. Then the resources, the natural, the extractive, etc. So that whatever that we learn, we'll be able to relate to the environment. Can't UN per se thinking through in order to solve um, the sustainable development goals challenge African leaders to think along this side to create curricula which are in tandem with the environment that they live? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Albert. Doc, over to you. Ah, right. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael, for the comment and Alabo, thanks very much uh, for validating uh, the, the point that I made. Um, I take from Albert's point, I agree with you, Albert, our education needs to be refined. And, and I think that what we are hearing from here, and I'm not surprised, is because it's blow, uh, blow P, blow B, is that we need to, there's, there's concern about doing something about education, both in terms of designing the curriculum to strengthen human capital, uh, development and then also providing skills to transform our natural resources into uh, into tangible values and I think I, I agree with this I have nothing to comment I have no more comment on this I agree the UN had done a number of uh, uh, supporting through this uh, both UNICEF have done some educational curriculum uh, analysis and made a lot of uh, recommendation and UNESCO is the same, they do a lot in education. In fact, UNESCO is the one that deals with uh, education. So the, 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 the answers are all there, the tools are all there. Um, at the level of African Union, 
when they developed what they call the Agenda 2063, about 2063, you want to see Africa actually their, their continent that is so strong and capable of engaging uh, with the rest of the world, and even much more on equal footing, uh, with tangible policies, announcing the, the diaspora into this and so on. Very fantastic, fantastic um, uh, goals. And one of which looks at the issue of education and how our education should solve our problems. The question is, would that take on, you know, I have this, maybe, I may be uh, altruistic or <laughs> naive in saying, but I don't think I am. You get the leader that you choose. Now, if we all want to see some of these changes happen, we need to find a way to get involved in, in our national body politic. Join a political party, join a pressure group, join and and join join organizations that would force, would put pressure on the levels of powers in the system to transform it. And I would like to encourage uh, young entrepreneurs here, born into a good ecosystem, occupy a very formidable part of our economic system to put pressure on the political system. Let's see that we want to have. Let's see that maybe in, we can organize to make sure that we have the type design or subscribe or describe the type of leaders we want to see occupy parliament. That can change policies that can reflect some of these ideals. The type of uh, leaders that we want to see occupying the office of the president and, and his cabinet, that can actually reflect the ideals that we're looking at. It's no longer tenable that we will just, we just allow things to happen the way it is and let politics become the construct of political parties. We don't serve any of our, our deeds. If we don't transform it, political parties are nothing but the consti constituents or the composite or the pool of the people that form it. So we get what we actually subscribe. And I think that we need to have a deep reflection as a country um, to do this, to change our body polity and ensure that leaders that come there, actually they are leaders that subscribe to a certain social contract and they believe to that ideals. That's the way we can change things. Thank you. Over to you, Yao. Yes, but you haven't answered the question about AOBA, your involvement yeah, in the AOBA. AOBA. <laughs> yeah, you, Yao, you, I, know, I, know, I know that you were trying to, uh, Okay, uh, that's a, uh, my, my, um, I'm very active in my year group. Very, very active in my year group. In fact, I was so active that they, want to, they deleted me the other time. <laughs> um, I, 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 so I, I engage with what we want to do, what our year group does, and like, like most of you do, contribute to uh, Accra Academy uh, ideals. Um, the Alba leadership, I, I, I know that they are doing their best. I haven't followed the work that the, the, the global leadership is actually doing. But I see that they're doing some fantastic work, raising funds uh, to refurbish uh, some, of the, some of the areas that, are, that needs to be refurbished in terms of uh, the, the hall and so on and so forth and the, and the gate. I saw that uh, people like um, Asmajan has also done something on the, on the sports front. So these things are very, uh, uh, you know, I, there are a lot of ideas. Could they do more? I think so. Uh, like the two things that I've highlighted in 2D uh, mentorship as well, I think those are things that would be very useful for people for, for Alba to consider. Uh, Alba also need to consider, one of, one of the things that Alba need to consider, quite frankly, is for us to ask this question. What, what, what kind of a crack do we want to see in the next 10 years? Is it an accra academy that is chaining? Entrepreneurs, innovators, inventors, or an academy that is what it is. I think that the world is changing very fast, and what will be required in the next 10 years require, you know, in people with different um, set of skills. And our, our, our school need to begin to think about that. I was even thinking that maybe we, sh we should leave out to what we are, the academy that we are, that. Uh, it should be possible that from there you can have, uh, uh, you know, you can graduate with a certain certificate that will enable you to move directly into Polytechnic rather than going to, to move directly into uh, maybe uh, 
not university or polytechnic, rather going through uh, through some some other other means. I don't know, but or a degree that enables you to to, to move into some some uh, professional career very quickly. Um, maybe associate degree of some sort. So academy we need to think about it. And, and then I also need to think about it and we need to ask ourselves, can we do that to construct? And then create, we need to build an endowment fund truly to be able to do something like that. Um, so whether or not I'm planning to take our leadership, I will always want to serve, but uh, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, good people who are leading at the moment and I wish you all support them with ideas to make sure that they function well. Thank you. And that's a very typical UN kind of answer and we appreciate <laughs> it very much. Um, let's go over and take D. Rose, humanitarian. And then um, there is one more question on the chat. I'll read that before you answer. So D. Rose, over to you. Hello. Hi, Rose. Hello, Rose. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Hey, that's, all, that's all for congratulations to my big brother. Thank Dr. You. Ishmael Dodu. Um, Mr. Ishmael, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Rose. Okay. <laughs> I'm calling I from Choco. I'm calling from Choco. I'm at Choco at the moment. And I have an organization around Jamestown, Gamashi, and Choco. And you are born and bred from Jamestown, Buko. In fact, I know your dad very well. And wow. I guess I always give thanks to God for how far he has taken you to. Your junior brother also is my friend, Edward Dodu. And I've been discussing issues with him for some time now. now how are we helping the children from Bukom, the grassroots, the scraps? Those that sometimes get 15, I get 15, but because of the environment, when they take their results or they choose a crack academy, you know, they prefer children that are coming outside from Gamashi. And sometimes it's, 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 it gives us headache because you know, Accra Academy was formed by guns and the school belongs to us, the guns. But we don't have a lot of guns children there, especially those from Gamashi Buko. Secondly too, I'll plead with you to sometimes come a little bit, come send people to come to Bukom because the children at Bukom are suffering. People are dying. We need a lot of support, especially the Rose Foundation. We need your hand, we need your support, we need your advice, we need you to come and build our community for us. So that is all I have tonight. I don't want to talk plenty because you've, you've spoken a lot and I love that. God bless you. Thank you very much, Diros Foundation. Um, and Buck, I will read. I will read the next question on the chat. It says, currently, all WHO needs is a QA pharmacy specialist, PhD in pharma pharmacy, to finance a generic drug development in a country. Why is why is it that so many African countries? aren't taking advantage uh, and this coming from Malabo and oh he says it was from class P actually uh, and he, he's saying this in reference to developing generic drugs over to you doc uh, thank you very much um, Rose you, you managed to uh, call in um, your, amen Amen. Your heart is my heart. It's my heart beat every single day. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we just formed this uh, GACART movement and we'll try and connect mm -hmm. with you. Uh, the GACART is actually mobilizing the Gandami community. Uh, and okay. one of the things, some of the things we're doing is really initiative around uh, entrepreneurial development, literacy, uh, smart classrooms, as well, smart classrooms and smart libraries, and the various things that you talked about. Uh, you know, how to mentor the young people, inspire them, uh, make sure that we can support them through education and they can mm -hmm. take care of, they can take advantage of opportunities uh, in life. This is what, this is what GACAT stands for. And we just formed uh, that 
um, you know, this year. Um, and it's, it's really a formidable group um, that we should look out for. So it would be good for us to um, actually uh, get connected to that. And so please reach out to me and we'll get connected uh, on the ground. And whenever I'm, 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 I'm in Accra, I'm in Buko. Uh, I'm, so uh, my, my, my best friend, uh, Ajo, Ajo normally knows when I'm coming around. <laughs> so you try and link up with him. But um, I try to visit COVID-19 or Nyakumabashia. She can go to Jomona, Agbele, Ma, Ekola, and Nyakumabashia. And when I'm coming, I will keep in touch so I'll be able to, to see. But each time I'm home, I'm, I'm with, my, with my brothers and sisters at Buko and try to catch up on, on what is happening. Uh, some of the challenges and the gossips and also uh, uh, some of the ideas they have about how we, 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 we team up. So definitely uh, um, WHO, you know, the, the question you asked is fantastic. Um, this is the same, same thing that happened with the, with the Ebola. Uh, we talked about setting our center, center for disease control in Africa into different spots and making use of the specialists here and growing them. And this is our advantage. Um, maybe if none of the African countries are taking over, this is uh, taking advantage. This is something that we will need definitely to push the, our country to, to take. I would, I would send signals to the powers that be and that would be able to, to have these. I need more information on these, which I can share. Uh, but certainly I think it's something to do. And I would urge, our medical students here, our medical professionals here, to get connected on this. And under the auspices of the Ghana Medical Association, I think this can, they can make this, this happen. And so we get as many specialists as possible join to, to the ground. The WHO has presence in Ghana, so I can connect them to the presence in Ghana. Either Ghana Medical Association, they'll be uh, very uh, happy to do this, that we can also look into that. So we can do something very practical. Thank you. So over to you. Hello. Yao. Sorry. Hello. Um, I was speaking and I, I realized that I was still on mute. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So um, I think we have pretty much exhausted um, the questions. There's the last one that has come in. Um, yeah. I will allow Albert to say something to Rose. Uh, with respect to Accra Academy admissions and Aoba's role and all of that. Yes. But the last Absolutely. question that has come in, uh, how can how can we get you an appointment? I mean, so basically, how did you get you an appointment? And we want to know how we can also get you an appointment. Uh, yeah. So let me answer that quickly, and then Albert can come in with the Rose question. So there are different routes to uh, to the UN. There's there's a very good uh, uh, route called the UN International UNV, um, and the International UNV gives you an opportunity to, to get paid once you actually volunteer for the UN. And by volunteer, you volunteer with your service and, and your professional background, and it helps you to to hone the skills that is required to be an, an international diplomat, as well as to learn the UN system. And you also contribute to a transformation in a community. So I'll edge. Uh, all of you to get on to on uh, to sign up to the UNV program www.unv.org and when you sign up to that program please uh, write me directly uh, with your details and I will make recommendations for you and that's one route and the other route is look out for uh, national opportunities uh, sometimes consultancies there, there are a lot of there's always recruitment going on um, and you know, the UN has a variety of backgrounds. You can be an engineer, you can be a MP, you can hold your uh, business administration, you can be a scientist, you be whatever you are. Uh, there's a wide range of spectrum of, of skills that are needed. So please look out for that as well. Then there are, there are young professional programs. So we have the one in UNICEF. Uh, uh, so try and look out for that. And then there's one UNFPA. UNDP uh, is also starting some, something um, for young Africans fellowship. So please get onto the website. Um, and whatever, whenever you you uh, 
you actually uh, apply, please, um, you, you, you know, let me know, and then I will make a recommendation for you. I saw that one person, so that's for the UN, and these are the different groups that you can, you can join uh, with each. So please, you know, get get onto it, and, and then don't give up when you apply, because uh, a lot of people will do it, but you will get will get into it. And if you want to apply and you want me to give you a look at your CV or something, um, please, you know, find a way to get to me and I'll, I'll make the time for you. This is part of the message. Now, um, in spite of how busy I am, I'll prom I promise that I'll make, I'll make the time. Um, so someone asked a question about uh, Accra Academy and I think that Albert, you are well placed to, uh, to sort of uh, make sure that a lot of my book home people can get access to a cracker to be like, a, I had opportunity a graciously to get. So, so over, over to you. Yeah, very well. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you also find a good evening, eh? Um, I'm also a girl. I was born and bred in Chocolate. Yes, it's true that Nakraka started from Gamashi, of which well, was founded by the Gants. It's also true that Shinakaka is also contributing to nation building. It's also contributing to solving the problems of the world, global solution. Or a move from the micros microscopic pointer to a multi ecosystem to bring in other, other people on board. Notwithstanding that, there is, a, there is a very sizable number of guns who are still in Accra Academy. They are being considered. And there is a great, there is a great um, favorable. I agree that is given to the Gamashi people. So, Auntie, 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 Auntie Rose, your issue is well catered for. Mm. So, like I said earlier, Akaka has moved on now solving problems of the nation, problems of the world. So, we need more people from different set of society to come on board. But the guys are also catered for. Thank you so much. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so let me go through the comments again, uh, and then we can wrap up. I think we are almost uh, about doing the two hours. I wanted to save the last five minutes to do a poll. However, uh, we were unable to conclude on the next speaker. And so I will postpone that poll to the next session. Uh, but just to uh, go through the comments. So, King, King Boat has provided the, the website www.undp.org uh, for anyone who, who might be interested. Or just simply Google UN and you will find a lot of um, information on the internet. Uh, Alabo says that connect to Dr. Kwame Assem, uh, PhD pharmacy specialist. Um, that's his cousin. Um, King Boat says, uh, thanks thanks for the reassurance and opportunity and that is in response to uh, your response to the question about how to get into the UN um, uh, let's see someone says <laughs> Raphael says quite uh, Baruski well something like that I hope hope you understand Baruski okay so it's been an amazing session. I think I can turn on my video right now. Uh, it's been an amazing session with Blobby Dr. Ishmael Ni Dodu um, talking to us about his journey from Bukum uh, to the UN. Uh, initially, when we spoke about this topic, he, he wanted to, to do from Ododio Dio to the UN. Uh, but for the benefit of uh, all, all the other participants who may know, constituency, I thought the name Bukum actually carried it uh, better. And so we settled on a journey from Bukum to the UN. And um, the, the crux of tonight's conversation has really been how to turn obstacles into opportunities. And I think so far, so good. We've done I will say a big thank you. Uh, Dr. Ishmael Dodu, I will give you the chance to do your, your closing remarks. Uh, but before you do that, once again, I just want to reiterate the key points from this discussion, which is to have a purpose, to be disciplined, to develop self-confidence, have enthusiasm, 
to build expertise and to prepare, 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 and also to have character. I mean, these are simple but young Erin uh, 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 Ishmael Nidodu has managed to rise from Bukum, which is, you know, right here in Accra, all the way to Oxford and to the UN. So over to you, Doc, for your closing remarks, and then we can call it a wrap for tonight. Um. Mine is just to say thank you very much. Um, you know, it's very humbling to be appreciated and that I, 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 I really, from the depths of my heart, to say thank you so much uh, for giving me this platform. I really believe that uh, there's a long way for us to go. We are a family. Uh, we are the people that will transform the country. We are the people that will impact it in a very big way. Um, and so all of us need to look out to the future and let's continue to strengthen this ecosystem uh, and let's, uh, let's really push, push forward with this. Um, uh, my sincere my thanks to Dr. Keith Lloyd from Oxford University who set up the Lloyd Scholarship and also um, help us to set up the Tertiary Education Scholarship Trust Fund uh, for Ghana, which I encourage bribing students to apply. Um, I also want to really thank uh, Apostle JP and I want to especially also thank my, some of my closest friends uh, who sometimes when I have challenges, I call Nene Wayo, uh, Lawrence, um, William Nete, uh, you know, Alawabu is here, uh, the Babs, uh, uh, and a few, these are, and the Yanaba, these are people that I, and, and Flesha as well, these are people that um, I normally connect with. Then Astroniga, <laughs> someone, I hope he was there. And so these are people that have been very part of my journey. You know, what we do is when I have ideas, I bounce back on these people and, and say, what do you think? And you know, so on. So that's the way we should be doing in all of this. And I, I sincerely thank um, um, other people as well um, who have been very encouraging of me. Uh, the positive of Manitoba, uh, the last she is my great friend, so my brother, he's been, uh, he's been on my own. Um, and yeah, well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful, uh, professionally uh, moderated session. Very excellent. You recaptured the points fantastically. Uh, I'm very, very happy. And please, I'd like us to take on the issue of mentorship. Let's establish as a concrete thing uh, the life school uh, after, after school, after uh, Accra Academy, after university. This is something that you can hold me into to help to, to, to build. Um, for the benefit of the, of the country and then um, by extension to all. So thank you. God bless you all. Thank you so much for, for giving me the opportunity and the platform. Thank God and God bless you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ishmael Omi Dodu. Uh, and thank you for your time. My daughter, my daughter, my daughter just texted something. She must have been watching. Oh, Clarice. Clarice. okay. Hello everyone, my name is Clarice Jesse Dodu. Thank you for listening to my dad's interview. I hope that he has inspired you. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me. All right, Clarice, please give us <laughs> I will respond swiftly because I have a lot of free time here. For the, my email is rjessidodu at gmail.com. Thank you so much. So everyone who joined this call and everyone watching on YouTube and on, on and Facebook, the bars, please, the know where to go to. David, David Oben, the bars, please. Make sure you mention David Oben, the bars. Okay. All right. So again, um, it's all well and good. We've picked up great lessons. This is the AOBA webinar series, the fourth edition. Thank you to Keith Lloyd for joining us and staying throughout the two hours. And thank you to Rafael Tete for connecting me to Dr. Ishmael. Because Ishmael is the one talking. Oh, the next session will be advertised and I will see you then when I see you. Thank you and have a good evening. No, no, no. This one is the UN guy. No, the one who came here the last time when you pick him from the airport. Thank you.
around you know where the epicenters of this uh, COVID situation are. Around you know where the epicenters of this uh, COVID situation are. Around.